Welcome to the Inspired to Be Authentic podcast. I'm your host, Matt Lancedale. Inspired to Be Authentic is a podcast where we converse with people who are living their most authentic lives. We get real with our guests and talk openly about how they live with courage to be themselves. We explore barriers they have overcome to be more authentic and aligned to themselves and their purpose. Today is episode 13, and we are joined by Francesca Elridge. Welcome. Oh my gosh, you said my name perfectly. I, I love you even more now. <laughs> I'm one of these people that I've had a lifetime of people mispronouncing my name. So, oh, um, I don't even bother telling people. I just spell it. My last yeah. name, L- Lancedale. For some, pe- some people have a hard time with that one. So. Lancedale, Lancedale. Yeah. In, my, in my brain, I was saying Lancedale. I was kind of making it longer. So, and Lancedale. that's usually what people do. So Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so today we're going to be talking about, uh, I'm starting kind of a series, so we're going to be do- doing some mental health talks. And today I've brought in Francesca and we're going to be talking about OCD. Uh, this is going to be a really cool topic. We're going to be talking about OCD and using nutrition therapy as a, um, as a means to recovery from OCD. So um, I want to share a little bit about um, Francesca. So she is a, a Kiwi. Love, we love yes. the Kiwis from, <laughs> from, from New Zealand. She's a dog lover and registered clinical nutritionist uh, who helps people learn how to improve and recover their mental health using evidence-based nutritional therapy. I have, she has a special interest in supporting people seeking recovery from OCD, anxiety, and the impacts of excessive stress and trauma. She also has personal experience of suffering from OCD for 20 years and overcoming OCD and various physical health challenges. So this is really, um, I always like to start out by talking to the guests a bit about like, t- tell me how you got into to doing all this. You obviously have personal experience with this. I want to uh, know a yeah. little bit more about that. Okay. Um, gosh, yeah, where to, where to begin? Because it's a long story and I'm aware that sometimes I can, I can talk for a long time. We got, <laughs> so, we got lots of time. We're good. <laughs> So basically, um, yeah, when I was 10 years old, uh, that's when I remember my OCD symptoms started. Um, And it started out for me as checking, which is like a common, what we would call OCD theme. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's lots of different types of OCD. Um, So just for the listeners who maybe aren't so familiar with OCD, um, yeah, common OCD themes would be things like checking, um, harm, um, contamination fear, um, intrusive sexual thoughts, intrusive violent thoughts, um, one that really isn't talked about enough, um, pedophilia OCD, which is essentially like a harm fear. It's where the the person suffering with OCD is having chronic, unwanted, intrusive thoughts. They might be a pedophile. Um, oh. There's, yeah, there's a whole lot of other OCD themes as well. I'll just, I'll touch on those few for now. Um, You know, there's religious scrupulosity, there's sensory motor OCD. Um, I guess the thing I want people to understand for people who aren't so familiar with OCD, whether it's the lay person or the health professional who wants to upskill, is that the symptoms of OCD can be as varied as the people who have it. And the key thing to really understand is that the thoughts are chronic, intrusive, and unwanted. Um, those are the obsessions. Mm. The compulsions are the actions that the person affected carries out to try to quell their anxiety. Um, okay. But it's only, it's only the temporary, so it's this vicious cycle because those chronic intrusive thoughts always come back. And carrying out the compulsions actually reinforces that OCD cycle. Um, that's one of the things that therapy teaches you is how to break that cycle. Okay. And I think that the other thing that's really important for people to understand, especially because I think when we talk about things like pedophilia, OCD, um, intrusive violent thoughts, intrusive sexual thoughts, you know, that can sound quite alarming. Um, it's certainly, you know, it's hardest for the person suffering from those thoughts you know, more than anyone else. But the thing to really understand whether you love someone with OCD, whether you have OCD, whether you just want to understand it better, is OCD thoughts are always ego dystonic. And that's just a, a fancy psychology term that means um, the thoughts are in stark contrast to the true nature and values of the person experiencing them. Mm. So a person having intrusive violent thoughts uh, or violent images 
is not a violent person. <laughs> That's why the thoughts are so distressing for them. Um, the person worrying that, you know, harming their loved ones has no intentions of harming their loved ones. Um, that's why the thoughts are so distressing for them. Um, and you know, in particular for the person affected by pedophilia OCD or POCD as it's sometimes called, um, they are not a pedophile and they never will be. And that's again, why the thoughts are so distressing for them. So in a way I was kind of lucky if I can say that because yeah, I started out with checking OCD themes which um, later morphed into uh, contamination fears and then metaphysical contamination fears. So I say I was lucky because um, I mainly suffered from the better known OCD things. Um, but although they're better known, they're not necessarily widely understood. <laughs> but it's certainly, it's certainly a little bit easier, to, obviously, to talk publicly about having had contamination fear than it is to talk publicly about having had, say, chronic intrusive sexual or violent thoughts. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that because I know there's a lot of people out there who suffer with those other forms of OCD and, um, you know, it can be really hard for those people to walk into a psychologist's office or a doctor's office and ask for help because they're worried they're going to be looked at like they're crazy or dangerous um, yeah. or someone's going to call the police on them. And this, you know, these things have actually happened to people with OCD. People have lost their jobs and um, yeah, the stigma, the stigma is very um, strong. Stigma is huge. Yeah. The yeah. misunderstanding is huge. And so, um, I mean, I basically, I suffered with OCD for just under 20 years. It was about 19 years. Um, it made my life hell through my teenage years. Um, it really affected my schooling, my friendships. Um, <clears throat> I had things going on with my physical health as well. And I lived with a great deal of shame. And I come from, you know, people might be thinking, oh, why, you know, why did you struggle for 19 years? That's ridiculous. Um, but it's, it's two reasons. I come from a family background where um, there wasn't the love and support that I needed. So like OCD, the, you know, the words OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder have never been spoken in my family home. It's never been acknowledged. There was no help. There was no support. Um, and then like most people with OCD, I carried a huge weight of shame, thinking I was crazy and not really feeling able to tell anyone <clears throat> what was going on in my head. Um, and so... Yeah, I really struggled through my teenage years and also my father um, became ill with cancer and then died just a few months after my 17th birthday. So wow. there was, yeah, there was a lot going on in my family um, and both my parents come from a background where they didn't get what they needed as well. So there was that legacy of trauma kind of being passed down. Mm. Um and, you know, I, and I have compassion for that. It doesn't mean that what happened was okay or what didn't happen was okay. But yeah, I have compassion for the fact that I know um, there was, you know, certainly historical trauma, just sort of that cycle perpetuating. So, um, yeah, like I think as, as is common for a lot of people with OCD, it waxed and waned for me. And when it was at its worst, um, you know, I could spend hours a day on compulsions. Um, I had like soap burns on my skin from excessive washing. Wow. Uh, yeah, especially around like my wrists, you know, from the lathering, um, lathering of soap. And yeah, I mean, I, I went from being that student who was top of the class and always got A's to um, getting C's and D's and not even finishing high school, which also reinforced the shame. Um, and then, of course, there was my father's death, you know, when I was 17 and it was not long after he died that I left school because I just felt like I can't even concentrate. Um, and so I kind of went out into the world as this very traumatized, unwell 17 year old with absolutely no idea how to look after myself um, and just kind of tried to make my way in life. And at that time, like a lot of people who've experienced childhood trauma, I wasn't actually aware that that's what I'd been through. You know, I wasn't aware that I was not only living with OCD, but I was living with complex trauma. Um, 
I had no self-esteem. I had a tendency to get into abusive relationships and friendships because that's what felt familiar. Um, and that pattern kind of continued, you know, for me, um, sort of until my mid twenties. Although I did have this awareness, you know, you you do kind of notice things. And I remember thinking, you know, God, why, why do I meet so many toxic people? Um, why do I always seem to have people around me who are telling me what a terrible person I am? Because I know deep down I'm not really. <laughs> um, but I didn't sort of go deep into it. But I had some vague awareness and. By the time I'd got to my early 20s, I noticed that OCD would always flare up when I was more stressed. Mm. Um, I had the very good fortune of meeting a soulmate when I was 25. So um, his name is Glenn. Um, he's now my ex-husband, but still a very valued friend. Yeah. And um, he was really the first person uh, in my world who... Um, you know, saw me and loved me and cared about me and valued me, which is always very healing. Um, but I think it was probably inevitable that there was definitely elements of codependency in that relationship. Um, but he, and you know, I, I remember this being 25 years old, um, lying in bed together one Sunday morning, and he was the first person I actually told about my OCD. So an illness that started when I was 10, I didn't actually tell anyone I had it until I was 25. So that was 15 years of um, wow. carrying that weight on my shoulders. Yeah. And that conversation came about, um, sorry, I'm pregnant. So I birth a bit at the moment. <laughs> I'll join you. Um, um, that conversation came about because, you know, we'd started living together and although my OCD was in a kind of lower at a lower, you know, to dial down a bit. Um, yeah, when you live with someone who has OCD, whether it's, you know, mild, moderate, severe, you're going to start to notice things. And so mm -hmm. he had started to notice things. And, you know, I would get really stressed about certain things, you know, like, oh, did you wash your hands after you took the um, trash out, you know? And then sometimes we would end up in um, arguments. Well, not really him arguing, but me getting freaked out and him sort of kind of, you know, being baffled and trying to understand why, why I was suddenly so stressed. Um, and I think it was just, yeah, one morning, something like that had happened. And he just sort of said to me, look, I need to understand what's going on. And, you know, no one in my life had approached me with that sort of compassion before. Um, you know, previously, it was like, you're a pain in the ass, your behavior is an inconvenience. Um, mm -hmm something I'll never forget being said to me as a teenager was, you know, you're a moody, you're a moody little bitch. Don't come out of your room. Um, so yeah, so I opened up to him and then I guess what happened for the next few years was, um, as is the case in a lot of, uh, relationships or families where, where a city is present and that compassion is there. Um, he ended up sort of being pulled into my, he ended up being pulled into reassuring me a lot, you know, and participating um, in my uh, compulsions, you know, um, which of course reinforces that OCD cycle. So that's a big strain on a relationship and um, yeah, wasn't healthy for either of us. And it's not to say that, you know, times were all bad. Like, you know, we had some amazing times. Um, we got married. We did some incredible things together. We, we used to go into the mountains together and climb together. Um, and yeah, did amazing hikes and stuff together and um, went sailing together, you know. So yeah, there were definitely some amazing times in that relationship, but OCD was a, a big strain on the relationship. And um, it eventually got to the point where my OCD was just getting worse and worse and worse. I was living with this um, hope that it would just magically go away. And I think my husband was getting frustrated by that. Um, and OCD doesn't, you know, doesn't tend to magically go away. Um, it tends to get worse, you know, and this is, um, you know, sort of World Health Organization um, data. Mm. Um, you know, it's, yeah, the longer you leave it without seeking help, the worse it gets. And that's certainly what was happening for me. And uh, 
Yeah, it, it got to the point when I was 29 where my physical health was falling apart and it was because there'd been a lot of stress, you know, like I'd worked as a teacher, which is a very stressful job. Um, and you're giving a lot when you're a teacher. And I, yeah. I had this, you know, my personality at the time and still to a certain degree is that I give a lot. And, um, but I was over giving, I was not looking after myself. I was skipping meals. Um, I was a clueless vegetarian. And what I mean by that, I don't mean disrespect to vegetarians. I mean, I was one of those vegetarians who had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. You know, I was living on like toast and fruit basically. Wow, yeah. um, and pasta. Yeah. So I had all these like deepening nutrient deficiencies. Um, I probably have stuff going on with my genetics, which I haven't yet had tested, but I probably do have stuff going on with my genetics that meant I was more vulnerable to nutrient deficiencies. Um, I'll just touch on that. What I mean by that is um, there are certain genetic <coughs> variants like the M MTHFR variant, um, which some of your listeners may or may not have heard of. Um, it's very common in people affected by mental health problems. It means that we have trouble metabolizing vitamin B12 and vitamin B9, hmm. which happens to be very important for nervous system uh, totally, structural yeah. health. Yeah. yeah. So I haven't been tested for that, but I'm pretty sure I have it because I show a lot of signs of it. So there was, yes, there was poor diet. There was years of unaddressed trauma. There was overworking. There was overgiving. Um, there was years of chronic unaddressed insomnia um yeah there was so much going on and it just all snowballed to the point where OCD had got so bad I was struggling to get out of my house and I was pretty much hysterical every day at some point in the day um because of OCD related you know fears and of course this was having a huge impact on my husband and one day he just broke down and cried and I'd never seen him cry before mm. And it just, it just woke me up. Um, and I'm really grateful that he did that, you know, that he got to that point where he was like, you know, I can't handle this anymore. Um, mm. And I was like, yeah, I, <laughs> I can understand why. Um, so that was the point where, <clears throat> you know, and it wasn't just, you know, seeing his suffering. It was, you know, I was, seeing suffering. I had the realization that I have to do something about this. It's, it's not going to magically go away. I have hopes and goals for the rest of my life that how are these things going to happen if I'm so unwell? Um, what, it wasn't, what, causes, um, <clears throat> what causes OCD? Nobody really knows at this stage. Um, I had a the therapist who I did my, my ERP therapy with, um, which was about five years ago. Um, he, I really liked the way he described it. He said, uh, he said, there are many pathways to OCD. All are speculative. None seem, uh, none of them seem like an adequate explanation on their own. And he said, yeah, it seems to be a combination of genetic uh, factors, social factors, cognitive factors, um, biochemistry, which is where nutrition would come in. Yeah. And I would agree. And I would say that that's the case for um, pretty much all mental health problems. You know, there's not usually one simple thing. Yeah, yeah. Bio, biopsychosocial yeah. model usually. Yeah. I've got all the animals coming in to visit me. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> this is Millie. Hi, Millie. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So that was the point where I basically thought I got to do something. Um, I don't want the rest of my life to be ruined, you know, and I was 29 years old and I think it's easy to go through your twenties and not kind of, um, worry too much about things or kind of think, you know, I'll figure it out later. Um, and I guess, cause I was on the cusp of 30. Um, yeah, I guess that kind of played a role as well. Just thinking like, man, I gotta, you know, I gotta figure out how to make my life what I want it to be. So, or at least give myself the best chance of that. Um, and so I started looking into my options and I kind of already knew it was going to be medication therapy. And um, I always get a bit nervous at this point in the conversation because um, I know that this is, it's really a mode of the topic of medication. Um, I know that it does help some people. 
I know that some people feel it really doesn't help them and it doesn't fit with their values. Yeah. Um, I, I fall into that category and I think, I think it's partly because of what I saw my father go through um, when he was unwell with cancer and dying. Um, some of the experiences I had with the medical system just left me feeling um, just shocked really at how it worked and it just didn't seem to make sense in a lot of ways. Um, so I'd always had this interest in um, what we would call natural medicine or uh, complementary alternative medicine, but I didn't know a huge amount about it, but it, it just made sense to me from the perspective that it was the whole person and getting to root causes of an illness and not relying on just one tool, but, you know, approaching health in a lot of different ways. Um, mm. well, how was it you said it before? Psychosocial? Uh, it's just biopsychosocial spiritual bio model. Spiritual. Yeah. 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 Use that in, in addiction counseling. When I was doing addiction counseling, it's the same uh, model used to explain the underpinnings of addiction. And Yeah. So um, what did I do? So I, I embarked on therapy first. And I like so many people who have OCD because now the, the clients who I work with as a nutritionist, I hear this all the time. Um, like so many people, I had the experience of struggling to find a therapist who actually understood OCD and um, encountering therapists who said they did understand it, but you have a couple of sessions with them and it becomes pretty clear that they don't. And, mm -hmm. and I don't mean that as a criticism, you know, like the therapists and counselors, they were good people. Um, they were good at their jobs, they were caring, but they just, yeah, they were in an area that they didn't really understand. So um, it wasn't a bad thing. You know, I learned from that, you know, you have to find a therapist who understands OCD and has experience working with people who have OCD. So I remember coming home from a therapy session one day, knowing that I wasn't going to go back and see that psychologist again, because it just wasn't his area. And I remember coming home feeling really disillusioned and it was, um, it was the 21st of October, 2010. I'll always remember that date. Mm. And um, I was 30 years old. I was maybe I turned 30 about six months earlier. And I was living, we were living in this beautiful rental house in this beautiful part of the country. Um, <clears throat> and like a stray cat had just shown up on the doorstep. All these, all these good things were starting to happen. Um, stray cat shown up on the doorstep, and I'd actually been saying, "I need a therapy cat," and then this cat just shows up <laughs> at my house. Um, I had started to just kind of slowly started to get my head around the concept of, you know, I need to reduce stress levels. I need to be doing a job that's not so high stress. Mm. So I was, um, I'd made the move from teaching English as a second language into um, working as a copy editor because I was a, a word nerd um, and I had a background in journalism and so I was working from home which meant you know that stress levels were greatly reduced and I didn't have to deal with sort of being in an office environment where other people could potentially unknowingly trigger you know your OCD um, <clears throat> So that was all good. And then, yeah, I came home on this day, got on the internet, thank heavens for the internet, and um, just started Googling, found an OCD support forum, saw that it had an alternative medicine section to that part of the forum. I think back in 2010, you know, forums were still a, a big thing. Uh, this was when Facebook, Facebook was around, but it wasn't as big as it is now. Um, and yeah, and I just ended up, coming to this conversation where um a guy he was actually from india as it turned out he was talking about the importance of um you know looking after your nervous system health mentioned that he was working with a naturopath and started like mentioning some specifics of you know the structure of the nervous system and i remember that he, he was talking about myelin sheathing and i was like what the heck is myelin sheathing yeah um so i did some googling and I ended up, I think I just Googled OCD and myelin sheathing. And I, um, for those who are wondering, uh, your myelin sheathing is just a, a fatty coating <clears throat> that um, wraps itself around. It's produced within the body, um, although it does require to 
to be as um, structurally sound as it can be. Yeah. Um, it wraps itself around um, the parts of the peripheral nervous system in the human body. And it's, it's almost like an insulating um, protective coating on your nervous system. And it's very, it's very fatty. Um, so things like um, healthy cholesterol levels, dietary saturated fat, omega-3, um, vitamin B12 are really important for creating this myelin sheathing structure. Hmm. Anyway, so I Googled that and I, I ended up on the website of um, a naturopath called Mary Reed. And I ended up spending like the next three hours on her website, watching all the videos, reading everything and just going, how the heck does this um, naturopath lady in America who I've never met in my life. How does she know so much about me? Like she's describing me, you know, and not just my mental health symptoms, but my physical health symptoms. Like she had questionnaires and there were questions like, you know, do you experience PMS? Um, do you have trouble falling asleep? Um, does being in crowds make you feel more anxious? Um, do you find it hard to focus when there's a lot of activity around you? Do you have a lot of gas? Um, <laughs> do, you, do you experience bloating? Um, do you have acne? You know, all these things that I'm going, yes, 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 all the time. Yep, that's me. Yeah. How does she, how does she know all this about me? And um, so I ended up contacting her and, uh, you know, I was at that point, and I think this is so crucial to recovery from any illness. I was at that point where I was so sick of being sick that, um, I was prepared to do anything. So I actually gleaned quite a lot just from being on her website. And I remember pretty much deciding there and then I'm not drinking caffeine anymore. I'm going to have to stop being vegetarian, which was a big decision because I was an ethical vegetarian. But I was like, man, you know, there's nutrients I'm needing that are just going to be so much easier to get if I start eating meat again. And I'd been having like meat cravings and I was kind of like, mm, is my body trying to tell me something? Yeah. So I started making these big changes and um, I got in touch with the naturopath. I just emailed her, kind of told her my life story um, and said, yeah, you know, this is, these are the changes I've made already. I've looked at your website. You know, what else can I do? Can I get an appointment with you? And about three days later, she replied and it all just went from there. And I, I ended up working solidly with her as my naturopath for about, um, for about two years. And, um, in those early days, I was seeing her pretty frequently and we were in frequent contact and it was just, you know, all online. Um, and I just, I did everything she told me. You know? um, I found her to be very kind. Um, she has had OCD herself. Um, she had a real gift for, or has a real gift um, for analogies, you know, for helping me to understand what was going on in my body. Um, she was very, she did a very good job of like educating me, helping me become more body literate, more nervous system literate. And, um, yeah, so I took her advice and everything she said was just, it just made sense to me. Um, and I just started feeling better, you know, and once you start feeling better, that motivates you to stay the course. And the thing that, um, you know, I want to emphasize, and it, and this is a conversation I have with all my nutrition clients now who are seeking OCD recovery. Um, there's no magic bullet. There's no magic supplement. Um, nutrition alone isn't the cure. It's not about being cured from OCD, but it's about um, rebuilding the foundations of your health and bringing everything back into balance. Because, you know, if you get to the point where you're having intrusive thoughts, chronic insomnia, all kinds of stuff going on with your physical health. You know, I mean, I had migraines, I had urge incontinence and I was only 29 years old. Yeah. Um, basically meaning I would need to pee and I would pee myself before I would get to the toilet. Wow. Um, yeah. Which I think probably the cause of that was probably a major B12 deficiency and how that impacts signals from the brain to the bladder. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, incontinence is a, is a fairly well-known symptom of severe B12 deficiency. Um, you know, I just had so much going on with my health that, um, yeah, it just needed to be rebuilt and it was about being persistent and consistent and recognizing that I wasn't, you know, I'd been sick for 20 years. I wasn't going to get better in a week or a month or a couple of months. Um, and I, 
I guess I was impatient in some ways, but I, I did understand that. And I did know in just a couple of months that although, of course, the OCD was still there, um, it dialed down. And the analogy that I, that I always use, and people seem to be able to relate to it, um, I think of OCD when it's, when it's moderate to severe, you know, when it's really bad. I think of it as it's like this dragon and <clears throat> being in the grip of intrusive thoughts and compulsions for me felt like being ragdolled in the jaws of a dragon. You know, it's like you've lost control of your own mind and um, you'll do anything to get rid of that anxiety. And um, what happened for me was as I started to work on my health and it wasn't just the nutrition, you know, stress reduction was a, huge part of it as well um it was like i kind of you know if you can imagine me in the jaws of a dragon it was like i kind of was able to go eh, and open up the jacket hop out and kind of you know dust myself off look that dragon in the eye and just kind of take a step back and and it was like in the you know the months that followed i was just slowly walking away from that dragon it was still there could still have OCD thoughts for sure. Um, and to this day, I can still have OCD thoughts, but now it's like that dragon is way, way off just on the horizon. Like I can, I have to look for it, you know, to see it. Um, it's not breathing. It's fire in my face. anymore. That's amazing. Yeah. What, and... what do you attribute to that? Like, what do you think where obviously it is holistic, you're pulling in things from, like you said, nutrition, medication, therapy, all that stuff. But, um, you know, let's, let's even just say somebody's listening. What could be something that you could tell them that was really effective for you? Um, I actually, I was asked this the other day through my, my business account because I, you know, I put out an invitation, send me questions about OCD, ask me anything. And one of the first questions I got um, from a lady, I think she's in the United States, yeah, she said, what was, you know, what was the single um, best change that you made for your health to recover from OCD? And I was like, wow, you know, how do I answer that? How do I pick just one thing? And um, I have to be completely honest and say it was the being persistent and consistent with the tools that I did use. Um, but just to be more helpful for the listeners, um, I think it was being willing to understand and accept that nutrition plays a huge role in our biochemistry and that's not how I thought of it back then you know that's kind of my putting my nutritionist hat on that phrasing that I'm using here biochemistry but mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it was the fact that I was open to learning about how how neurotransmitters are built you know what nutrients are actually needed to build serotonin in the body um uh, how do I get my digestive system to work as well as possible so that it's actually absorbing the nutrients from my food? Um, why are B vitamins so important to nervous system health? How do they work in the body? Why is magnesium so important for reducing anxiety, making sure that you're getting enough magnesium? Um, is, it, is, it the, true that, is it true that we have more yeah. neurotransmitters in our gut than we do in our brain? I've heard that from um, we certainly a lot a lot of neurotransmitters are produced in the gut, um, in particular um, serotonin, which is you know the one that most of us are familiar with, mm -hmm. um, and GABA as well. Um, GABA is an acronym for gamma amino butyric acid. <laughs> Just in case the name sounds funny, GABA, um, and yeah, and that's that that is important to understand because for a lot of people. Um, who are having struggles with their mental health, you know, whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, whether it's panic attacks, um, you know, research, because there's a whole lot more research being done now into that gut brain access, that gut brain connection and mental health, which yeah. is wonderful. Yeah. And yeah, the research is increasingly finding that, um, you know, if your gut is inflamed, um, if it's, if it's leaky, if your, you know, intestinal barrier has been compromised by things like stress, or infection or food allergies, um, overuse of antibiotics, um, lots of different things can affect mm. the health of your gut. But yeah, the research is increasingly finding that when your gut's basically not as well as it could be, um, things like you know inflammatory um, chemicals that the body produces 
as part of trying to heal the gut. They can actually leak out of your gut, get into your bloodstream, travel up to your brain, cross your blood brain barrier and worsen anxiety wow. and depression. Yeah. So when you look at the you know, other research is finding, when you look at the, the blood or the stool samples of people who have um, OCD compared with the stool samples, I was actually reading a research paper on this yesterday, the stool samples of people who don't have OCD, there's just higher levels of these, um, the body's own inflammatory markers or chemicals. Um, Unbelievable. Like, like C-reactive protein in the stool. Yeah. So um, gut health is definitely a, a big part of yeah addressing your mental health and especially if you and most people will know this intuitively you know if you have a history of bloating diarrhea constipation alternating diarrhea constipation um, reactions to foods if you've never felt quite right since that time you traveled to asia or africa and, and picked up um an infection you know had food poisoning um or south america um you know these are all clues these are all things that need to be um, investigated and um, my nutrition clients um, those who have OCD for a lot of them there is something going on with their gut health um, but it's on a spectrum you know and it's yeah, yeah you got you got to dig to find out exactly what's going on yeah what do you recommend people stay away from um, that that are struggling with OCD? Like, is there certain things that for you, it was like, okay, I can't do this. I got to stay away from this because this is going to exacerbate my symptoms. Um, okay. I'm, I'm going to mention a couple of things here. And the first one, um, a lot of people are going to hate me. <laughs> Caffeine. Coffee. I know. <laughs> yeah. 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 And especially, especially coffee because it is one of the, um, you know, has some of the highest levels of caffeine compared with say, you know, tea or chocolate. Yeah. Um, oh, and en energy drinks as well. Energy drinks and coffee would be the two worst offenders yeah. um, for high levels of caffeine. And there's an article on my website um, called Why I Quit Caffeine. It's part of the OCD series on my website. And um, it's one of the most read articles on my website. And I, the reason I had put that article together was... Um, I didn't want people to think I was being the fun police and I wanted to help people understand <laughs> the, the science behind what caffeine actually does in your brain. Like yeah. it actually changes, you know, the chemistry of what's going on yeah. in your brain. Caffeine. Yeah. I don't drink coffee and, for that reason. Cause it, I've already got enough tapes playing up here. I don't need to exacerbate it, make it worse. I'm, I'm very much the same. And, um, and the other thing to understand, cause I had a client say to me just recently, she was like, Oh, you know, I have an addictive personality and, this is why it's hard for me to, you know, give up the foods I'm reacting to. And it's hard for me to give up the coffee. And I sort of said to her, yeah, okay, you could beat yourself up and be like, oh, this is my fault. And I said, oh, but we could also look at it in a very black and white scientific way. Um, some of us genetically, we hold on to caffeine a lot longer. It takes a lot longer for our livers to break it down, you know. So that could be why caffeine affects you more. Um, so yeah, there's, there's so many factors that come into it, but in a nutshell, caffeine is very depleting. It's a diuretic, so it makes you pee more. And then when you pee, you're peeing out your water-soluble vitamins and minerals, in particular B vitamins and magnesium, um, all of which are incredibly important for the structural and functional health of your nervous system, for building neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA, which are our slow you down, inhibitory, calming, soothing, anti-anxiety neurotransmitters. Um, caffeine also um, depletes uh, GABA um, in the brain. It blocks the receptors for GABA. Um, I go into this in a lot more detail in the article on my website. But um, yeah, it's just, it's just not your friend. That's the way I like to describe it to people. If you have OCD or any other form of clinical anxiety, yeah. caffeine is, is not your friend. You know, it, it basically, I think we've all, if you live with OCD or anxiety, we've all had that experience of having a coffee and just, you literally just feel your brain whirring, you know, <laughs> you feel your thoughts yeah. speeding up and, um, Whoosh. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and you might break out in a sweat. And it's, you know, it's also actually um, triggering the stress response in the human body um, when you have caffeine. And same with alcohol. Um, mm. It triggers the release of cortisol and adrenaline, um, which are stress hormones. 
and we know from some of the research that people with OCD tend to have higher levels um, of cortisol um, or certainly higher levels of times of day compared with people who you know, didn't have OCD. Um, yeah. So yeah, so, so two things to avoid is I would say, um, take a break from caffeine and alcohol. And even if you're like, but I only have one coffee a day or you know, I only have a couple of beers um, two, three nights a week, it's not, it's not that I'm saying, oh, that's excessive. It's just that for your particular biochemistry um, and your health history, it's just too much of a hit for your nervous system at the moment. And you need yeah. to give your nervous system that chance to recover. Um, so certainly, yeah, having a break from caffeine, having a break from alcohol so that you're not getting those depleting effects, mm. nutrient loss impacts on neurotransmitter function. Um, and then the other thing to remove from your life is toxic people. <laughs> Always. Um, and that's, yeah. And that's such a big one. And it's, um, because in the past year or so, more and more people started to um, come to see me as their nutritionist. You know, my search engine opt optimization has been working. People have been finding me more, which has been great. That's great. Um, a thing that I've noticed now with some of the clients who I've been working with for sort of, you know, six, nine, 12 months, um, a lot of them, you know, they've got so on board with the nutritional changes, you know, changing their diets, taking their supplements. They've had some diagnostic testing done. You know, we've dug deep to kind of see what's going on with their particular biochemistry and then put in place, you know, nutrition and lifestyle changes um, to support their health. But for some of them, um, yeah, the lifestyle changes, what kind of, it doesn't come, it, it takes more time to kind of get their heads around it. Um, and a big part of the lifestyle change is, is the stress reduction, you know? So, you could be eating the healthiest foods in the world. You know, you could have had all the diagnostic tests done. You could um, supplements, you know, seeing your nutritionist or your naturopath every two or three months. Um, but if you're overworking, if you are giving, 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 giving to everybody around you, um, if you've got, you know, toxic family members or um, relationships, workmates, toxic maybe work environment, um, you know, just difficult people in your life who are draining and unreasonable um, and selfish. Um, you're not going to reach your full potential health-wise. And <clears throat> it's, it's a real self-love thing. And I think a lot of people um, affected by mental health problems a big part of our healing needs to be to love ourselves more, to put ourselves first more, to say no more, to stop putting up with other people's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amen. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because if, if you have those kind of draining people in your life who don't, you know, genuinely sort of respect you and care about you, um, it does impact your health. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, if there's someone difficult in your family, um, that you have to just totally cut them out of your life. You know, it's very much situation dependent and it's something that each person can only decide for themselves. Um, it's definitely, you know, my wish for every person with OCD would be that um, you not only work with a nutritionist, if that feels right for you, but also that you have a therapist who is not only experienced in supporting people with OCD, but who can also help you build your self-love and mm. um, understand how your past is affecting your present and, you know, help you evaluate the relationships in your life. Are they exhausting you or are they lifting you up? Um, there's a lot of layers to, to mental health recovery and OCD recovery. And, you know, I can speak about the nutrition side of things, um, but from my own experience, yeah, there's, the self-love is hugely important. The stress reduction is hugely important. Um, and so I have, I do have these conversations with my clients and I have to acknowledge, you know, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a counselor, but um, I certainly encouraged people to, to work on being kinder to themselves and, um, and stop putting up with other people's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. 
I like that a lot. So as somebody who's a mental health advocate, and I'm always, you know, I've struggled and suffered with mental health my whole life. And your story is actually very similar to mine in the sense that I uh, grew up gay, and I hid that for 13 years. I was the only one who knew this big secret about about what was going on in my and that created a lot of anxiety for me. And then it was also something that I wished would change, right? I wish that, you know, it would go away and that sort of thing. So our stories are very similar and I experienced a lot of shame and I, I kept all of my suffering in secrecy. So this is why I'm a big mental health advocate. And I want to maybe hear from you uh, what we can do as people who um, support and, and are advocates for mental health. If we know somebody suffering from OCD, what can we do to support them? Oh, good question. Um, I guess, wow, yeah, if you're the kind of friend or family member or partner or teacher or colleague who cares enough to actually, you know, notice and think, man, something's not right here. You know, this person is suffering and needs some help. Um, I guess that, I mean, that in itself is, is pretty amazing. And I guess if, you know, I think that, um, yeah, what I really needed when I was younger was that's what I needed was I needed someone to come to me and say, what's wrong, you know, like, um, in a, you know, in a private, you know, kind of sit down with me in a private space in a safe space yeah, and just say, Hey, look, I've noticed this. I've noticed that. Um, I'm worried about you. Um, so I think that could be a good way to start just, you know, pick the, pick your timing and pick the environment carefully. Um, so maybe when someone's like right in the middle of an OCD spike might not be the right time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when there's a sort of a quiet private moment, um, maybe even when you're doing something fun together, you know, to just be able to say, Hey, look, I've noticed this. I've noticed that. Yeah. I'm, I'm worried about you. Um, and even, you know, if you could even say reading a little bit about OCD or I know a little bit about OCD and I just kind of wondered, is, is that something that um, you're experiencing? Because I think for people with OCD, and I, I, I know this from my own experience, I see this with my clients as well, there's so much silence and so much shame around this illness, which is just so ridiculous. Yeah, it makes it 10 times worse. <laughs> It makes it 10 times worse. And, um, sorry, I've got backing doggies. <laughs> it's all right. Um, Bailey, it's okay, honey. All right, come here, come here, come here, come here. She's, um, one of my dogs is a rescue dog and she's, um, she's kind of anxious. And I think yeah. sort of, I think that's partly how she and I ended up together because I sort of understand her anxiety. Um, yeah, something that, um, I think is a huge, can be a huge relief for people who have OCD is just being actually able to talk about it because we don't talk about it. And, and like, I'm sure it was such a huge relief for you when you finally got to that point where you could say, you know, oh, I'm gay yeah. and talk about it. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's, it can be very healing in itself. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and I guess the thing to recognize, um, cause I have a, I have a Facebook group, um, where other nutritionists and naturopaths come it's it's called everything ocd and it's like an education group for oh awesome okay um yeah other health professionals who who want to learn more about how to support people with ocd and i think a lot of the people who join that group expected to come in and see me um sharing a lot of information about you know analyzing your clients blood test results and things like that and we do talk about stuff like that but a lot of what I talk about in that group is um, is just sort of letting people know, like you don't have to be an expert on OCD to help someone with OCD. Um, you don't have to understand all the ins and outs of the illness. You don't have to know every OCD thing. Um, mm. You don't have to have had it or you know been through therapy for it. But if you can just simply you know be able to say, um, I understand that, you know with this illness there's chronic intrusive thoughts and they can be really distressing um but that it's you know it doesn't um 
it doesn't necessarily say anything about you, those chronic intrusive thoughts. And something that I, I sometimes say to um, my clients who have OCD is, you know, there's nothing you could say that would shock me, you know, or um, offend me or, you know, I'm not going to think you're crazy. Um, yeah. You know, if you tell me that you're having intrusive sexual thoughts or violent images or um, fears that you're a pedophile, um, yeah, that's, that's just OCD. It's, <laughs> it's not who you are. There's nothing shameful about it. Um, if you've had health professionals who you've sought help from in the past who've looked at you like you're crazy, shame on them, you know, not shame on you, shame on them. They yeah. should know their jobs better. Yeah. Um, I actually had that conversation with a client very recently. She'd been to three different psychiatrists and they'd all just looked at her like she was nuts and she wow. stopped talking because... I think she was scared, you know, that they were going to call the cops on her or something. Um, So I think, yeah, just letting people know um, that you're worried about them, you know, and maybe just you're broaching the topic of OCD and saying, you know, I I understand that it can be very distressing, you know, and that it's characterized by chronic intrusive thoughts that cause a lot of anxiety. Is that something that's going on for you? Um, Mm. And I think it's also important to be aware that some people who have OCD, that's what they have. And that's, I've seen this in some of my clients and it breaks my heart. Um, I had one client, she had been suffering from um, harm, OCD thoughts for, oh God, five years, I think it was, five to 10 years. And she went to five different psychologists, five before she found one who diagnosed her with OCD. And when she got her diagnosis, her reaction was, how can I have OCD? I'm a really messy person and I'm disorganized. Because years of, um, she bought into that societal misunderstanding and stereotyping yeah. that OCD is about being clean and neat and having yeah. everything in, in its right place. Yeah. Um, and it just, it really broke my heart when she told me that, that she'd had to wait so long to get help, that she'd had to go to five different psychologists. Yeah. And, um, and it's not the first time I've heard that type of story. Yeah. Well, and I think that's where people make light of OCD because they, they're they confusing being anal retentive with OCD. And it might be a, a trait of OCD, but it's not OCD. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. a, a lot more, um, a lot more invasive than that for sure. Yeah, and and the way that I like to sort of explain that to people is, you know, there's a difference between having a preference for a clean, tidy house and being in a situation where um, you're having, yeah, chronic distressing thoughts about something. You know, that's not not a choice. That's not a preference. Yeah. Um, You know, some people color code their wardrobe by choice. That's fine. (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's not the same as having OCD you know if you're choosing yeah. to do that that's that's just your preference yeah exactly. yeah um <laughs> so I like to do a couple things um with, with my guests uh one of the one of them is this is me uh tip of the week so this is me is really about self-ownership and how we can be more authentic and kind of step into um who we are. And I was drawn to your energy because of, uh, I pick up that, that, that vibe from you that you've, you've worked through a lot of these things. You've kind of stepped into this, this wholesome energy of who you are. And, uh, is there something that you could share with the, uh, the guests on how you've done that? Um, I think part of it is, um, I've developed a sense of pride in, in being a survivor. You know, I've gone from years of feeling so hugely ashamed of what was going on in my head um, to actually just being able to say, you know, this is, this is what I went through and um, this is how I recovered and having this sense of wanting to, um, I feel like for a lot of people with OCD, they're kind of stuck in the woods in the dark. And what I'm trying to do is light some lanterns and go this way. (laughs) There's a way out, you know, um, 
And I'm not saying that everyone with OCD has to, you know, share their story and go on podcasts. I mean, I've been on national radio in New Zealand talking about OCD and I'm not saying everyone has to do that because I know yeah. for some people that would be kind of scary yeah. um, or it just, you know, wouldn't fit with who they are. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think just if you can get to a point where you, you view yourself as kind of a badass, you know, like you mm. look at what you've been through and survived and well, not kind of a badass, a badass. Yeah. <laughs> um, like and you develop a real sense of pride in that and, um, um, you know, see yourself as, as kind of a warrior because, you know, OCD is, is one of the most distressing, um, debilitating mental health conditions. And if you can survive that and, <clears throat> come out the other side and grow some if i can borrow a quote from favorite yoga teachers grow some flowers out of your pain yeah um there's something to be immensely proud of i think yeah, um, yeah. i like that actually that's really i said that to today in one of my groups that i'm a fucking warrior <laughs> yeah yeah because of the things that i've overcome right our, our suffering is um it can, it can create us into a victim or a victor. And I think I've, yes. I've always been the type of person that I've taken the road of wanting, you know, I'm, I'm the victor because I, I, I take that warrior mentality that my suffering has created uh, so much depth in, in who I yes. am. Yeah. And that's, that's something else that I say. Um, well, I say it to my clients, but I, I say it to all people with OCD, um, you know, given, given the chance being on this podcast, um, you, it, it may not feel like it right now, like when you're in kind of the depths of severe OCD or you're in the early days of recovery, it may not, it may be hard to feel like it, but honestly, when you really struggle with your mental health, when you really um, struggle with things, you know, like, like being queer and, you know, and carrying a weight of shame around that. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if queer is the right, right word to use, but I want to use yeah. it just to be encompassing yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the rainbow community. Yeah. Um, yeah, when you when you go through you know those real struggles with your health, with your identity, um, when you go through you know trauma, um, it may not feel like it when you're in the depths of it, but it honestly it makes you 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 do have the power to um, let it make you a more amazing person, you know. You can come out the other side of it and just have so much more self-compassion, um, self-compassion first and foremost, compassion for others. Um, and I guess what I would call emotional intelligence, you know, because you, you've been to like the depths of hell, <laughs> yeah. you know, with your mental health and your emotional health, um, then you won't really know what it's like to, to 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 experience the opposite of that well you won't you won't feel the the fullness of it maybe um how can i say this yeah it's 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 like so there is something about really suffering and overcoming that that just um i guess some of the things that i've noticed that it's given me is it, it's really enabled me to relate to other people who are suffering yeah. Um, in all in all different kinds of ways, um, it's given me skills to relate to those people. I, like I'm not uncomfortable with human suffering. You know, if yeah. if I'm around someone who's been through a horrible trauma or someone close to them has just died, um, I'm very much at ease with being able to sit with that person and let them, you know, feel whatever they're feeling and to support them. I, I don't feel awkward. Um, so I consider that a gift and yeah. I just, I really appreciate little things, you know, like just a day when the sun shines and you go for a nice walk um, and you laugh with your partner and you eat some nice food. Like that's, you know, that's the stuff that makes life worth living <laughs> and, and just waking up in the morning and feeling healthy, you know? And yeah. I think that you don't fully, fully appreciate those things if you haven't had periods of your life where you didn't have those things, you know, where you didn't yeah. have your mental health, your emotional health, your physical health. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's such a, it's a pretty amazing thing to have gone from, you know, times in your life where you honestly thought about ending your life to times in your life where you sit there and you go, man, all the cool stuff I would have missed out on 
Yeah, yeah. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, I, I, I don't know if that answered your question. Of course, of course, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do have one last thing that I like to uh, do and then we can wrap up. Mm-hmm. But I, um, so I, I always ask my guests a question. So I've compiled a list of 31 questions, which is random mm-hmm. questions. And uh, I call it, how much of me can I be? So it's really, it's an opportunity for us to kind of uh, be vulnerable and um, celebrate our authenticity. And you get to choose a random question. So what's a number between one and 31? What would you choose? Um, I'm going to choose 21 because it was the 21st of October. That was the day that I found my naturopath and really got yeah. started on my OCD recovery year. So 21. Okay. Um, Ooh, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> How can authenticity enrich our relationships? Mm. relationships. It helps us connect, you know, like I think if, if I wasn't. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. That was the wrong one. Oh, <laughs> my bad. My bad. 21. Okay. Is there, is there something that you've dreamt of doing for a long time and why haven't you done it? Ah, is that more fitting? Yes, <laughs> yes there is actually there is. And this is like, this is on my list of things to do that. Um, I know that if I don't do it before I die, it's going to piss me off. Um, <laughs> I would really love to sing in a band. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I like yeah. that. I like yeah. that. I, I love to sing. Um, I don't think I'm the world's best singer by any stretch. I think I'm, you know, I'm okay. And over the years, you know, like I've had some singing lessons here and some singing lessons there. And um, I played the piano. And part of my OCD recovery was I, I bought a piano because I wow. stopped playing the piano. That was something that OCD had taken from me. Like, fuck you, OCD. I'm going to play yeah. the piano. Sorry, I've sworn a lot. That's <laughs> right. <interview>. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but something I've never, you know, I've been to like group singing classes and, but I would just love at least once to have the opportunity to like get up on stage and sing, you know, in a band. Um, That's amazing. I hope you, I hope that comes, uh, well, make it happen, make it happen. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) yeah. So I don't know how I'll make it happen, but it's... It's definitely on the list. And actually, I'll just add one more thing to that. I started um, learning to surf a couple of years ago, which I've also found really good for my mental health. And again, I'm I'm by no means um, a good surfer. (laughs) But um, I would love to get to that point where I'm able to just, yeah, like draw a line, uh, you know, along the green face of a wave. And because I'm at that stage in my surfing um, where I kind of stand up and I fall down pretty soon after. But yeah, yeah to be able to get to that point where you can even, you know, carve some turns, it just, when I watch other people do it, it just looks like, it just looks like freedom. It just looks yeah. like the best feeling. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. So hopefully by the time I'm 50, because I'm 40 now, hopefully by the time I'm 50, I'll be like a, a decent surfer. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I like it. I like it. Um, so for people that um, want to find you, they want to do some work with you, you can be found at your website, which is uh, Francesca Eldridge health.com. Yeah. Although this is where I should say, I'm actually, I'm just about to go on um, maternity leave because I'm expecting okay. my first child. Um, yeah. So yeah, something I didn't think that, you know, would ever happen. Something that yeah. I thought, you know, that OCD had um, taken from me, the chance yeah. to become a mother. But um, once again, fuck you, OCD. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, at the moment, I'm only um, existing clients just because it didn't feel right to me to be taking on new clients. That's fair. At they can find where, um, resources on your website and they can find articles yeah, and yeah. stuff. So they can they go can and find resources on my website. Definitely check out the OCD series, which is in the articles and recipes section of my website. Um, okay. And the other thing is I'm actually, and this is scary. Um, I've been writing a book um, about nutrition for OCD yeah. recovery and um, it's about half done. Um, I'm sort of slowly like sending chapter by chapter to my book designer. Um, yeah. It's going to be an ebook. So my goal is to, before the baby arrives, get this book finished and published. um, Amazing. Yeah, and available for purchase so that there is a, you know, a resource that people um, 
who are you know wanting to learn more about nutrition for OCD recovery, even if you can't see me for an appointment for the next several months, um, you can get started with this book. And it, um, it covers like all the foundational stuff, all the things that I did um, in my own recovery, all the things that I see help my clients. Um, yeah, and it talks a little bit as well about the mindset of OCD recovery, the role of trauma in OCD. So it's not just about nutrition, but it has a real focus on nutrition. Awesome. Um, so if you follow me on Instagram, you'll be able to stay tuned with updates about cool. the book and when it's going to be ready. I'll put those links in the show notes so everybody can access them in, uh, to your, your website and to your uh, Instagram as well. And if you want to send me the Facebook um link to your Facebook group as well. I can add that in the show notes as well. So people, if they want to be informed there cool. as well. So. Okay. Thank Great. You, Matt. Awesome. Oh, well, so, so nice to meet you. Like, yeah. I've followed, been following you on Instagram and I was actually thinking today, like, yeah, how did I find you? And I just, it was about a year ago, I just somehow stumbled across you on Instagram and um, yeah, similar feeling. I was just, I just thought, what a nice guy. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. My, bu- my business has completely morphed um in the last year just completely doing different things and you know it's cool though because yeah. i keep all my old posts so it's like nice to see my evolution and kind of how i've got to where i am now so it's uh yeah it's always exciting that was cool because i think around the time i started following you you your focus was more on um the work you were doing as a personal trainer yeah and yeah. then it was kind of like suddenly you were like actually no i'm you know i'm offering coaching for gay men and and drawing on all my experiences as a gay man to help other gay men and i was like wow yeah. that's, that's awesome and i thought that was really um courageous and one of my best friends um is gay and <clears throat> i think but thanks to her and her openness um it's it's just helped me have an awareness of um yeah some of the struggles and prejudices that um you know people in the queer community go through and so i'm always always like really happy to see you know someone who's been able to um yeah find that self-love and and yeah live authentically and um Mm. yeah and get past you know all the struggles that can go with you know living living um as a lesbian gay bi transgender or queer person yeah 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 well thank you for saying that appreciate it um, well, yeah, thank you. And I really appreciate you um, contributing an hour of, well, more than an hour of your time uh, to share with uh, the audience and with myself, your story and, have, you know, having the courage to, to bring forth your story. I think it's, uh, it, it, it speaks a lot. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. <laughs>